I think it's important to practice, practice, practice. It's like we practice surgery or medicine. We have to practice communicating. There's the verbal and there's the nonverbal. The verbal, and I have the, the, the skills listed here that I think are Im, important. Um, paraphrasing, reflecting back to patients, summarizing, allowing them to question, saying to the patient, what I hear you saying is that you're concerned most about being able to take care of your kids while you're in the hospital. It's striking to me how many patients, how often patients will spend 10 minutes of a 20 minute visit uh, focused on what their logistic arrangements are going to be because the husband has a trip to the East Coast and he needs to go on a certain time and the wife wants to schedule the surgery for this and they have to make arrangements for the kids and the dog and I want to just sort of shake them and say, listen, you really should, you know, work that out on your own. And yet, I think it's important to give patients space, at least some, space to, to, um, to, to talk about what's most concerning to them. Now, if I think that it's just going on too long, we really are going to short change some of the more important issues, I will interrupt them. And I'll say, let me just pause right there. I hear you saying that you're very concerned about the logistics. If you will allow me, let's... Uh, let's let's delay that and defer the logistics to a different time. I'm happy to to talk to you about helping with that, but really, quite frankly, I think those are issues you're going to have to figure out on your own. I want to really maximize our time, optimize our time together. Um, so I will. That's sort of the the equivalent of grabbing the steering wheel from the 16 year old who's learning to drive because I'm not happy with the direction that the driving is going. So there are verbal cues and tips, and there are also nonverbal, a relaxed posture not tensing up or relaxing, not crossing your arms like I'm doing now, but sitting with an open posture, the things that we learn in medical school, eye contact, gestures, facial expressions, tone of voice, what we teach you the, to our medical student, active listening, which means eye contact, leaning forward in the chair, that kind of thing. The value of human touch, I think, cannot be overestimated. Now, I, I work in urology, and there are special issues and concerns in urology and gynecology where touch is not necessarily appropriate, but to the extent that you feel you have established a rapport with a patient, there is nothing like a hug or a, 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 a tap on the shoulder or a really a strong handshake even. If that's all you're comfortable doing is just a handshake, shaking a hand and just holding that handshake a little longer or doing the old second hand, like the Pope, um, with the second hand on there when, hand, when handshaking with the patient. There is just something about pausing in that moment, really leaning forward, not letting go, and letting the patient know, in summary, you're going to be okay. We're going to do everything possible. And just pausing like that and just allowing a little bit of silence. There is music in the rests between the beats. My last slide is a quote from the same article. And Dr. Peabody said that the good physician knows her patients through and through. Time, sympathy or empathy, and understanding must be lavishly dispensed. But the reward is to be found in that personal bond which forms the greatest satisfaction of the practice of medicine. One of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity. And this is the line that's quoted so often from Dr. Peabody. He said, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And I think that that rings as true today in 2012 as it did 85 years ago in 1927. And I expect that it will be as true at the end of this century as well. So with that, I conclude my, my formal remarks, and um, you can take the slides down or leave them up as you wish, and I'm happy to um, entertain questions or, or comments. Thank you. Um, Dr. Litwin, can you hear us, or do we have to go closer to the mic? I can hear you. It's a little bit echoey. Okay, so we'll get up closer. All right. <coughs> Who would like to ask something? <clears throat> okay, Dr. Lindwin, I think I'm going to open up the question period. Uh, we have something in the, the culture here, the Greek culture, uh, where uh, we have relatives begging us not to tell the patient of a bad prognosis and diagnosis. When do you think uh, we should make the exception 
and actually go ahead and tell the patient what he or she actually has? That is an outstanding, outstanding question. And I face that more frequently than I thought I would. I will tell you, I'll give you a slightly long-winded answer to that. And this is just my own opinion, of course. My perspective is that it's best for the patient to be fully knowledgeable about everything, you know, all diagnoses. And this comes up for me very often in cancer. Don't tell mama that she has cancer. Don't tell her. And my perspective on that is that ultimately the goal should be to tell mama that she has cancer. And I tell the patients, but I don't necessarily tell her straight away if the family asks me not to. But I engage in a dialogue with the family during which I try really hard to convince them of why it's important for mama to know that she has cancer. And I tell them this. Number one, she probably already knows. She's no idiot. She raised the two of you, I'll say to the two daughters or the two sons standing there, she raised the two of you very well to be concerned, thoughtful, compassionate adults. She's smart enough. She doesn't think that she's here at the doctor about to have a surgery to have some body part removed just because it was redundant. She's having the surgery or the treatment because there's something serious going on. And if she picks up on your cues that you don't want to talk about it, then she won't talk about it. And you can go through the next year, perhaps the next six months, the next year, the next however long, not talking about it. But I would argue, I'll say to the family, that it will be a much less satisfying experience and a more difficult experience. And it will be much more difficult because there will be many, many issues that come up where you will have to propagate that lie or continue that lie. I use the word lie very delicately because I don't want to be offensive to patients. But it is a lie if we don't tell mama that she has cancer. And I say to the patient's families, please trust me enough to be able to tell her this news, but in a way that's going to give her the tools she needs to help deal with it. And ultimately, if mama has terminal cancer and mama is dying, you do yourself and her a grave disservice by not telling her. Because if she only has a certain length, you know, limited length of time left, then I would think that you and she would want to get the most out of it. You want to get the most out of those moments that you have. And when I have end-of-life conversations with patients and their families, I, you know, try to stress this as well. So I will ultimately defer to the family's choice. But I will tell you that in greater than 90 percent of cases where the family has asked me not to tell the relative that that's what we're dealing with, that ultimately I've been successful in convincing them, and we do it together, in the room, together, so that the patient's family can later on reinforce what I've said so that that night or the next day or the next week, when mama is all freaked out or concerned, that the patient's family can say, yes, mama, but remember what the doctor said. He said, we're going to do this, this, and this. It's not going to be so bad. We're going to get treatment. You're going to be okay. So you arm the family as well. I think it's a form of denial to the patient's family themselves when they don't want the family member to know what a certain diagnosis is. So I, sorry for the longer answer, but I err on the side of really trying to convince them to share the information with the patient. But I won't violate that confidence and that trust. If they feel very strongly about it, I would say one time out of ten in those situations for me, the patient, you know, I respect what they ask. It's much more difficult for me if English is not the first language of the patient because the family, you know, is doing the, if the family is doing the communicating, they ultimately can choose to say whatever they want, and I'm at a disadvantage 